Hey, what's going on? It's Matt Polis, and it's time for another episode of Meat Sauce for Tuesday, March the 16th, 2021. This is episode number 22. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. If you have not yet done so, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you're listening to this. Also, consider leaving me a five-star review on Apple Podcast. This will continue to allow people to find the show and it'll help grow the audience. Thank you as always to those of you who have checked out an episode, have checked out a couple episodes, or you find yourself coming back each and every week. It really, really means a lot. So uh, please consider leaving the five-star review. I think there's five up there right now, which is pretty cool. It'd be cool to be at like 10 in the next two months or something. I have a lot to talk about today, I think. You know, of course, another edition of What's on the Shelf. Plenty of sports talk with NFL free agency beginning, NCAA March Madness bracket is set for this weekend. Baseball's right around the corner. But I wanted to start with this kind of, I don't know, open monologue type thing that I kind of start each episode with. I haven't really talked about what this beginning segment is of the show other than I just kind of talk about my last week or so and talk about something I think is important and I was preparing for today's episode yesterday and I was really struggling to feel like I had something profound to say in this first section of the show today you know like insights on something important or something that I think is of interest. I just didn't really have anything specific. I mean, I I have stuff I want to talk about, but it feels like it has to, the timing of it and the purpose behind it. You know, if I just came in here and talked about something completely random with no backstory or no reasoning why I'm talking about it, I feel like that would be kind of weird and difficult. So I think I decided I just want to use this first part of the show today just to say that I am grateful. You know, the last year has been a struggle for a lot of people, you know, including myself, for really a lot of things beyond our control. It doesn't always feel beyond our control, but there are some things out there that are beyond our control. And, you know, I take a look around at my life and and what has happened with jobs, you know, friendships over periods of time. And and there are plenty of times when I'm pretty down on myself and and don't feel like I have a ton of confidence, you know, and these times have been scary. You know, there's so much uncertainty about the future. It's officially been a year since I have worked anywhere and that, and that can really affect you mentally. I know, I know it's affected me. And I I mean, it's something I've been experiencing for essentially 365 days straight. You know, not every day, you know, has those those moments where you kind of get lost in your own head. But, you know, there's been there's been a lot of them, you know, and it's easy to feel down on my luck or down on myself. And it's hard to look on the bright side of things sometimes. You know, you feel like the world is out to get you. (laughs) Don't worry, I promise I'm getting to where I actually feel grateful (laughs) and as we crossed over that year mark you know when everything was starting to shut down I look back on the last year and and really just decided I'm gonna try and continuously look at the positives that are going on in my life you know I'm healthy I have a great girlfriend that I share a great apartment with I've got new hobbies and interests that I really enjoy doing even old hobbies and interests that I really still enjoy doing. You know, I finally started this podcast, which continues to challenge me each week, you know, to think creatively and uniquely about how to try and make it better each time or how to try and make myself better each time. So when it boils down to it, the only thing in my life that really has been bogging me down is just not working or having a job during this pandemic. And it really, it started to show me just how we are all taught or brought up to basically identify ourselves with our jobs. And if we don't have that specific career or job that we just, we aren't doing something right, something's not going right. 
like obviously working is a good thing. Jobs are important to have, you know, <laughs> because it provides money to live for those hobbies and interests that I enjoy, you know, and it can offer often a great sense of fulfillment, you know, but we so often self-identify by what our career is or what we do for a living when people I think are just so much more than that. And when I was able to kind of break through that wall, you know, it really helped me see just how grateful I am to be where I'm at. You know, you might be thinking, well, finally, Matt, welcome to the club. You know, we've all known this for years. But I think this is the type of thing that needs to be constantly revisited, you know, within ourselves to keep us grounded and and honestly keep us humble and grateful for what we do have and for who we are as individuals. You know, I recognize that there are others out there who have been hit so, so hard by this pandemic, and it may take them years to recover financially, emotionally, physically, you know, and and my heart goes out to those people. And I hope everyone is able to get back on their feet as quickly as they can, because nobody deserves to be ruined by this pandemic. It's just not right. You know, we all deserve to have an identity outside of a job and outside of just trying to make ends meet, you know, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my life and I'm looking forward, you know, to when I am able to go back to work and continue building my life, you know, to be what I want it to be, you know, and, and I obviously wish the same for you. I'm just grateful that as crazy as it might sound, I'm grateful that the only thing that's wrong really in my life is just, Right now, a job isn't working out or that career isn't working out or whatever. I'm thankful that that's my biggest concern. Even though it is a concern, there's so much other positives happening, you know, within my life and around me that, you know, I can't be too upset, you know. So um, that's really all I kind of wanted to talk about with that as I started to think about that stuff more about being grateful for so much it it just allowed this whole this whole little portion here to uh to kind of come to fruition so now that the word vomiting is behind us <laughs> uh, let's get into this week's edition of what's on the shelf In honor of St. Patrick's Day being tomorrow, we're going to go across the pond to take a look at the Middleton Distillery and the Red Breast 12 Single Pot Still Irish Whiskey. The Middleton Distillery is located in Middleton, County Cork, Ireland. It is owned by Irish Distillers, who is also the producer of Jameson. Red Breast is the largest selling single pot still Irish whiskey in the world. A single pot still whiskey is when the whiskey is made by a single distillery from a mixed mash bill of only malted and unmalted barley. Uh, So the difference between Irish whiskey and Scotch whiskey is that Scotch is made of 100% malted barley, whereas Irish contains a mixture of that malted and unmalted barley. Uh, The unmalted portion of the mash bill is said to kind of give the whiskey a spicier, thicker texture, almost like a biscuit type flavor. Uh, so Red Breast 12, which we're talking about today, is aged 12 years in oak casks and comes in at 80 proof or 40% alcohol by volume. Uh, the price on this bottle fluctuates quite a bit from what I've seen. I bought this in Ohio for $60. To be honest, the 80 proof doesn't really entice me too much, you know, especially at a $60 price point. Um, it does come in a pretty nice box and bottle, uh, so that's probably <laughs> partially the reason for the higher price along with the tariffs that have been in place, which I just heard that those tariffs are actually being lifted, which may bring down Scotch and Irish whiskey prices here in the U.S. a bit. I'm not sure if that will happen or not, but um, 
it sounds like that could be a potential thing. Uh, I would like it to be a little higher in proof, you know, but this, this bottle has a really unique flavor profile. You know, on the nose, you get some nice subtle spice along with some vanilla and fruit. You know, single pot still whiskey is known to kind of have this buttered biscuit type note. And I definitely can see where people are coming from with that. You know, it's, it's very interesting and a good change of pace, really, from those higher proof bourbons. You know, on, on the palate, since the proof is lower, it allows a lot of the flavors mentioned in the, in the nosing notes along with some honey. You know, and it drinks really nice, definitely a nice sipper and, and overall a fun experience. You know, not having that heat from the proof really actually helps you almost just enjoy the amount of uh, flavors that this whiskey brings to the table. You know, there's in bourbon, a lot of lower proof bourbons don't always have like a well rounded flavor profile, but with the Irish whiskey, it definitely does. Uh, there's also a uh, cask strength version of this bottle. And I, I would definitely love to try it at some point. Uh, it comes in a lot higher proof and, and is non-chill filtered. And and then Redbreast also has a 15-year and a 21-year Irish whiskey. So obviously all of those are more expensive than what I just paid for. So I'm kind of hesitant to think about, you know, getting the same bottle just at a higher proof or more expensive or whatever. Uh, just because there's still so many out there I want to try. But I, I really think this is a, a quality product and it would be, you know, a great Irish whiskey to take you on your whiskey journey to the next level and, and kind of branch out to different styles of whiskey. You know, I, I know a lot of people love Jameson, you know, especially at the price point, but Redbreast is definitely several steps up, up in quality that you get from this bottle. So it was my first Irish whiskey I bought. And when I opened it first, I don't know if it was the glass I was using or what it was, but it didn't come across to me too strongly. I didn't, I wasn't in favor of it, but then I tried it again a few days later in a different glass and man, it, it blew me away. So a completely different experience than bourbon, still a lower proof. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great bottle. If you're looking to get into Irish whiskey, it's a little expensive, but you know, it could be one of those special bottles for you. So Redbreast 12, great Irish whiskey. I'm going to enjoy some on St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. It's going to be fantastic. And yeah, that's all I've got for this week's What's on the Shelf. All right, let's take a look at some sports from the last week or so. It's, it's a big week in the NFL. Free agency talks were able to begin yesterday at noon, which I don't know. I don't think I realized that because I have been talking about on here that the new new league year starts tomorrow at 4 p.m. But I didn't realize on Monday at noon they could start kind of the free agency process. So there are going to be a ton of signings and moves to be made, you know, starting this week and heading into the NFL draft at the end of April. And and actually, I was as I was preparing for this episode. Yesterday, so many new signings were happening. I couldn't keep up. I was watching the Pat McAfee show on YouTube, and they were covering like each signing, and and they were barely keeping up. You know, I'll tell you, this kind of stuff gets me so hyped. I love free agency and trades. It's one of those things for me that I remember where I was and what I was doing when I hear about you know crazy trades that I didn't expect, especially with my team. And, you know, like when the Browns traded for Odell Beckham Jr., I, I remember I was sitting down just getting ready to eat breakfast tacos for dinner. And I remember just like getting up and screaming and running around the room that I was in just in dif disbelief, like just constantly like, oh, holy shit, holy shit. Uh, so some key signings so far. Uh, yesterday, news broke that the Cleveland Browns signed former L.A. Rams safety John Johnson to a three-year, $33.75 million deal. And this is a huge signing for the Browns. I think it kind of flies under the radar a little bit just because John Johnson isn't like that super prolific name, even though he's a prolific safety. They get the safety that they so desperately need. You know, you line him up with Grant Delpit, Denzel Ward, Ronnie Harrison... And that's a great start to build, 
building or rebuilding the secondary, you know, I swear, I, I just have so much faith in Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski, you know, they're making things, making things happen. The youth on the Browns, the amount of talent and then the amount of youth within that talent is insane, you know, or maybe the other way to say is there's so much youth and the talent within that youth, it's insane. It's, it's pretty amazing what they're doing. Uh, and then let's see, also, the Baltimore Ravens signed offensive lineman Kevin Zeitler to a three-year, $22.5 million deal uh, with $16 million of that guaranteed. So the once Bengal, Brown, and Giant are now is now coming back to the AFC North to play with the Ravens. So maybe he'll play with the Steelers at some point here and play for the entire AFC North. I'll be honest, I don't really like it. <laughs> I don't like when the Ravens get better. It's really annoying, so they need to stop doing that. On an impressive note, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have been able to keep both Levante David and Shaq Barrett with multi-year deals and pretty hefty price tags. As a Browns fan, I'm a little bummed because I thought the Browns would be in play for one of those guys, but kudos to Tampa for being able to essentially keep everybody together after winning a Super Bowl. You know, Usually, a lot of those high-profile guys end up signing elsewhere after the Super Bowl, but good for Tampa to be able to to kind of keep everybody there. I did see so a ton of defensive ends and edge rushers went off the board yesterday. I saw the Bengals late uh, late last night sign Trey Hendrickson from the Saints to a four-year deal. Um, there's been several others that have gone, but uh, I saw for today, so the Broncos, Denver Broncos have to decide what they're going to do with Von Miller because any of his guaranteed money in his contract is owed after today unless they do something. So there's potential that they could be looking to trade him and move on from him today. And I swear, if those Browns don't move in and do something to get Von Miller, I don't know. I mean, if we don't get him, whatever, but how amazing would that be? Miles Garrett, one side of the line, Von Miller, the other. (laughs) Oh, yes. That would be amazing. So I need that in my life. I need that energy. Take a sip of coffee real quick. And then other crazy news with Drew Brees announcing his retirement, the Saints signed quarterback slash tight end slash fullback slash offensive lineman slash whatever you need him to do Taysom Hill to a four-year 140 million dollar deal yeah you you heard that let me repeat that so Saints signed quarterback slash tight end slash fullback Taysom Hill to a four-year 140 million dollar deal it's insane and apparently Pat McAfee was trying to figure this out yesterday, but apparently all of the years are voidable on the contract, which Pat doesn't know what that means. <laughs> and if he doesn't know what that means, I definitely don't know what that means. You know, it seems like NFL teams are trying to kind of work around the salary cap issues, you know, that they're facing with contracts. You know, lots of guys are restructuring and putting money on the back end of the contracts to free up money now for their teams to spend. You know, this all years avoidable type thing seems odd, you know, but I'm, I'm sure it will start to make sense moving forward as more info becomes available. You know, I know Patrick Mahomes restructured his 10 year deal to open up some money for the chiefs to go out and get guys for this upcoming season. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, many, many more will continue to do the same. The question I ask is, you know, when does that money come due? I mean, at some point these teams are going to have to pay up. But I guess, you know, pushing things further into the future allows it to get worked out at a later date. You know, things happen to where, you know, a team goes into a rebuild, which, you know, you maybe don't see happening right this second. But maybe five years down the road, they start rebuilding and then the contract, I don't know, who knows. Uh, The Kansas City Chiefs, speaking of them, also signed offensive lineman Joe Thune to a five-year, $80 million deal. And that's a that's a big signing for the Chiefs, you know, especially after just cutting Eric Fisher and Mitchell Schwartz last week. You know, they definitely needed some O-line help, and they got one of the best in Joe Thune. So 
pretty amazing. He is from the Dayton area, which is cool. Uh, a lot of people had him linked going back to the Bengals, but the Bengals continue to uh, screw themselves in free agency and not really sign anybody. So kudos to the Chiefs for getting Joe Thune. Didn't even see them on the radar at all. There was a bunch of other teams involved, and all of a sudden the Chiefs just like swooped in and and uh, and got him. So, like I said, new league year for the NFL starts tomorrow. I'm sure there's going to be plenty more stuff today. I'm I'm definitely going to put on the Pat McAfee show when it comes on at noon because they have all the breaking news and it's really fun to watch on YouTube. So actually, if you're home or have access to watching YouTube at like 12 o'clock and you will love football, turn on the Pat McAfee show. Man, it is it is just so fun. Uh, let's see, March Madness begins this week. The NCAA selection show was on Sunday, and the Big Ten is legit. I don't watch a ton of college basketball because I kind of need that season of like not stressing out because I already stress out about NFL, college football, and baseball. So I don't I don't need another thing stressing me out. But they have nine teams in the tournament, you know, with two of them as number one seeds and two of them as number two seeds. Crazy. It's awesome. You know, so congrats to to U of M earning a number one seed and the Buckeyes earning a number two seed. Uh, the first four play-in games start on Thursday, the 18th, which usually those games are played on Tuesday, you know, of the week that March Madness starts. But maybe they're pushing it back to ensure everyone playing is COVID negative, I guess. Uh, I think I saw every team and player has to have like, I don't know, seven negative tests before their first game. I may be saying that wrong, but it's something like that that I heard yesterday. You know, kind of before they get into the bubble, they have to have so many negative tests before they can start. Uh, So then the first round begins on Friday and Saturday, which typically that first round is played on Thursday, Friday. So everything seems to be just pushed back ever so slightly, which is, you know, whatever. Uh, Because all games are being played in Indiana, with the majority of them being played in Indianapolis, you know, which is really great for that city. I'm really excited just to sit back and watch a bunch of games as, as, you know, they're usually so good. Like, I don't even have to care about either team, and just some of the the late game stuff that happens, it's just, oh, it's so fun. I did see that this is the first time since 1976 that both... Duke and Kentucky did not make the tournament. 1976. That's pretty crazy stat, you know, when you consider March Madness happens every year, you know, well, except for 2020. But anyway, good luck to all of those sports teams. You know, hopefully we can get through the tournament without any COVID disruptions. You know, that would be really great. It's going to be a fun tournament. I don't have any predictions. I'm not going to do a bracket. I just I'm going to watch and enjoy and and that's all. That's all I can really say. Uh, let's see, moving on to some Reds updates. Uh so the team announced last week that infielder Jonathan India and left-handed relief or maybe starter, probably relief, left-handed pitcher Brandon Finnegan have both been invited to big league camp. Uh they made some other less notable roster moves, but these two really stuck out to me. You know, Brandon Finnegan really might have a chance to make the big league club coming out of spring training. He's been in the minor leagues for so long and and just hasn't ever seemed to be able to get it figured out. And but it seems like he he may have something going for him here, so maybe I don't know if that's Derek Johnson the pitching coach <clears throat> finally getting across to him or other guys on the coaching staff or how that works, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to watching him develop because you know, he was on the Royals when they won the World Series. Like he, he was the, the. I think he might be the only player to pitch in the College World Series and the World Series in the same year. So he came up with the, like he got drafted by the Royals and he came up like that fall and pitched for them in the World Series, which is insane. But then he got traded to the Reds and just hasn't ever been the same, or it hasn't ever really developed into, you know that guy I think that we traded Johnny Cueto for, you know. I am really getting excited for Jonathan India. You know, he he's kind of a surprise for me. I think a lot of people, he is too, for how well he's playing the spring training. You know, he's kind of got that young, exciting attitude or, or swag to him. You know, he's got the long, curly hair going on, you know, but he's definitely taken 
several steps forward with his game. You know, I remember last year they would talk about him and how he's just not really hitting well. He's not coming to fruition. Year before that, same thing. So I, I am wondering if he can consistently hit at the major league level. You know, because, you know, in spring training, you aren't always facing big league pitching, you know, to really know how he's going to handle it. You know, but it's great to see a guy who was drafted so high by the Reds, you know, seeming to be turning the corner and, and could be helping out, you know, the big league club very soon. And it's becoming even more possible that he may join the team just based off of injuries that the Reds have, you know, here to start the season. I'm going to talk about a couple of those here in a second. You know, it, it looks like the majority of the guys that are potentially injured are on our, our day to day for now, you know, but we'll see if that gets extended. I actually did see one of these guys did get extended to the put on the IL, the 10 day IL. So, uh, let's see. Joey Vada was put on the 10 day IL last week, not because of injury, but he was, he tested positive for COVID-19. So he's been out. I haven't heard anything as far as if he's symptomatic or how he's doing, but I would imagine he's doing okay. I hope he is. Uh, Sonny Gray is expected to potentially miss the first week of the season with some back spasms, which isn't good. Sometimes those back spasms never go, (laughs) they go away, but like it takes a long time. And, you know, he's, he's one of those prolific arms that we have and and the Reds really need him. So hopefully he's not out too long. Uh, TJ Antone looks like he may have tweaked his groin, but is expected to make his next start. So I have to keep an eye on that, how long he goes in that start. Uh, Because he definitely has the chance to make the starting rotation. I think he's going to. He's been pitching lights out this spring training. So, Um, so right there, you know, definitely you don't like seeing Antone or Gray with possible injuries. You know, those are two guys that are more than likely going to be in the starting rotation. So, Uh, and then Shogo Akiyama, outfielder, he has a left hamstring injury. I'm not sure on the timetable for his return. You know, I just saw they did put him on the 10 day IL which for those that don't know is the injured list, put him on the 10 day injured list yesterday. So, you know, he, we're getting to that point where, you know, opening day is a couple weeks away. So hopefully he has a a quick recovery and he's able to be on that opening day roster. He already missed some time a couple weeks ago because his wife suffered an injury due to a falling tree. A tree fell on her. Apparently, it was pretty serious, and I guess everything's okay now, but that's terrifying. Uh, and then Lucas Sims, he's had elbow issues. Oh, Jesus. Lucas Sims, he's had elbow issues uh, really since the beginning of camp. Uh, so he hasn't pitched in a game yet, I don't think. I did see he threw 10 fastballs off the mound last week, which is a good sign. You know, hopefully he continues to make more progress. You know, the bullpen really needs him. He was lights out last year. You know, he, oh God, he is, he's probably one of my favorite pitchers on the Reds, just with his velocity and with the spin rate that he puts on the baseball. It's, he's, he's pretty incredible. And, you know, you definitely never like to see a team having a bunch of injuries during spring training, you know, because it all just kind of snowballs into the regular season. And if the Reds are going to break camp with some of their key guys being injured it really could affect the hot start to the season that they always all talk about and that they desperately need you know you know so hopefully some if not all of those guys can get healthy before they head to Cincinnati to open the season but you know only time will tell this team just doesn't seem like it has a lot of depth at least from a position player standpoint you know so those guys definitely need to stay healthy as healthy as they can really you know, the pitching is a little different as they do have a lot of depth, but not necessarily a bunch of guys with major league experience. You know, I did see Wade Miley is expected to start this week. So that's good news because he's been battling injury since we since he signed with the Reds. You know, so I, I think he's better than what we've seen. He just has been so injured. It's like we don't really we haven't seen, I think, the true Wade Miley yet. So hopefully that's coming because especially with Antone and Sonny Gray potentially missing some time, it's going to be huge to have a guy like Wade Miley, you know, to eat up some innings. Uh, Some news from spring training games that I've seen, you know, one thing I've enjoyed from the Reds this year so far is that they've made a few comebacks in some games. 
you know, which may not seem like much, but it's great to see them be able to kind of battle back late in games, score some runs when they need it, because over the past few years, and if you watch the Reds and if you're a Reds fan, they have struggled to string runs together. You know, it's either basically home run or bust. You know, so the fact that they can kind of string some hits together, get some runs, get some guys on base, you know, maybe this is a sign of things to come, you know, which would be really good. A really, (laughs) really good thing. Well, we are just about two weeks away from opening day. March Madness starting this weekend. NFL free agency and trades are going to continue to be hot off the press. I think that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you are doing anything for St. Patrick's Day tomorrow, enjoy. I'm going to be sipping on some Irish whiskey, and I'll see where the night takes me. (laughs) I hope you have a great rest of your week. Please like, comment, subscribe to the show, and I will talk to you next week. Bye, everybody.